Federal Parliamentary Secretary Josh Frydenberg joins us now from Sydney. Josh Frydenberg, good morning. Nice to be with you, Virginia. Um, good to be talking to you this morning, particularly in the aftermath of the G20, which we'll get to in just a moment. But more significantly this morning, the signing of that agreement, the free trade agreement between China and Australia. Has Australia got everything that it wants? Oh, this is a groundbreaking deal. Look, we'll be absolutely delighted with this announcement. And so should, too should uh, a whole range of sectors around the Australian economy. It's going to produce more than $18 billion for Australia over coming years. Up to 95% of our exports over time will enter the Chinese market tariff-free. There will be great um, announcements for our services sector. I mean, services Virginia make up around 70% of the Australian economy, but only around 17% of our exports. So now healthcare services, education services, financial services will get much easier access into China. Agriculture, particularly beef and dairy, where tariffs can be up to 25%, look like getting a much better deal, which will put us on equal standing, or if not better, than New Zealand, who has seen a, a supercharge of their exports to China since they agreed an FTA with that country in 2008. And of course, investment. I mean, China has four trillion dollars worth of reserves and that's looking for a home to invest and Australia's a good place for it. Um, I did ask you whether we got all that we wanted. Are there any elements of the deal that's about to be signed today that the government will be regretful about or that we didn't manage to get over the line? Look, it's fair to say there are a couple of tough areas. Um, they obviously want greater access for their state-owned enterprises. We want greater access for our sugar and our rice and other agricultural exports. Um, it sounds like they're going to be parked, those issues, for a couple of years, but we're not going to lose this opportunity to close a very good deal. Okay. And Andrew Robb deserves a huge amount of uh, credit for what he's done here, Virginia. He's made eight trips to China and just the last year and it looks like he's secured a brilliant outcome for Australia. We've um, spoken before in this program and of course elsewhere there's been lots of discussion of the agricultural aspect of this deal. I'm interested in talking though about the, um, the services sector that you mentioned which is mm. as you mentioned a huge area here in Australia but not necessarily an export market for us. Mm. We understand as you say tourism health providers they're going to build and operate services there and that state-owned Chinese companies have missed out on preferential treatment which mm -hmm. gives us an advantage as well. But what guarantees or assurances do you have about the way that those business will, businesses will be able to get on and do their businesses, be free of, of let or hindrance, in able to, to get done what they need to do in China without any state interference? Well, as you know, they have struggled to get that access to the Chinese market. They haven't been able to own assets over there and there's been... Uh, been swallowed up in red tape. Well, that's going to be streamlined now as a result of this deal. And I think we've got very good assurances in this agreement that our services sector will get preferential access into China. I mean, it has to be said, uh, Virginia, that China has signed a quality deal uh, or reached an agreement for a quality deal with Australia. And the reason why is I think they want to send a much broader message about doing a deal with a developed Western country, namely Australia, and it's in their interests as well as in ours. And they're already our biggest two-way trading partner, $150 billion of two-way trade. And they're also the number one trading partner for another 130 countries. So they are the big boy on the block. And for Australia to get this deal is going to be setting up uh, future generations in this country for years to come. So you would be confident advising a healthcare provider, for example, here in Australia to go over to China to set up shop there and you'd yep. be able to give them assurances that they could, they could do their work without state interference? Absolutely. And I think China recognises that Australia brings a lot of expertise in this area. I mean, just look at uh, you know, Ramsey Healthcare. They're operating in our region, in Indonesia, for example. They're operating in Europe. Uh, they would love to get greater access into a market like China. So too with our aged care providers. And uh, that's in the best interests of Chinese consumers. And as China becomes richer, I um, mean, it's moving hundreds of millions of people into the cities, into the middle class over time, mm -hmm. they're going to have much greater need for sophisticated services that we can provide. So it's a win-win for China and for Australia. Uh, when it comes to the, to the recently, very surprisingly recently imposed tariffs on coking coal and thermal yeah. coal um, yes. into, into China, I think it was a 6% tariff that was imposed there, you've managed to, to claw back um, the tariff on, on one aspect but not on the other. Detail that for us and, and why is that? Why do we have to wait a little bit longer for that second, for the second aspect of that to be wound back? Well, you're right. We weren't too happy with the uh, imposition of those 
tariffs on coking coal, which was 3%, and on thermal coal, which is used to produce electricity, coking coal is for steel, uh, the thermal coal tariff was 6%. And it just shows you if you've got a free trade agreement, you don't get the imposition of those tariffs because the other countries with free trade agreements with China didn't get those tariffs. So what we're going to get today is an abolition of that 3% tariff on coking coal and a phasing down uh, of that thermal coal tariff from 6 to 4% but then to be abolished over the next couple of years. So that's also a very good outcome for Australia because the resources industry is just so central to our economy and that's worth billions of dollars of exports to us every year. I want to just turn to the G20 now and mm. to the, uh, the uh, uh, guarantees that all the countries of the G20 have made in relation to boosting the size of the global economy. Australia's contribution is interesting. Our 16-point contribution uh, seems to rely on measures that have been previously announced already but have been mm. claimed in this communique as new. For example, spending on road and rail projects, the six-month waiting period of new start for young job seekers and the paid parental leave scheme, which the government hasn't even legislated yet. How do you stand by your claim that you're part of the global economy in trying to boost productivity and boost the economy all up when you're putting down measures here that you actually can't even guarantee? Well, we actually are very determined to implement them. We've just been obstructed in the Senate. But that's, uh, but that's, but I'd have to jump in there. That's because uh, our time is tight. That's the point. Given mm. that you actually can't claim them because you are being obstructed and you haven't got them through, this is actually a false claim. No, no, absolutely not. Uh, but what you're actually pointing to there is the political difficulty for all jurisdictions in getting hard reforms done. And that's why Tony Abbott referred to those issues of the medical co-payment and university deregulation in his comments to leaders, because everybody can relate to those particular difficulties that they face at home. But we have committed to boosting growth and we believe the implementation of those measures, uh, getting back to budget surpluses, cutting red tape, investing more in infrastructure, which is a rolling plan, may I say, at uh, uh, Virginia. It's not just one or two announcements. We're continuing to make more announcements. We'll actually see Australia play its part in boosting economic growth by more than 2% over the years between now and 2018. So that is important part of the Brisbane Action Plan and I think it's uh, going to be uh, something which other countries would look to for advice and uh, maybe even to follow. I understand that that's the ambition and I understand that that's the aim but we're talking here about the politically achievable and when, yep. you're, when you're talking about commitments in a document like this they have to be realistic. So many of those are simply not realistic. The $7 GP co-payment will be blocked by the Senate. Overhauling higher education looks like the Senate's going to block as well and as I mentioned pay parental leave not even on the agenda. So you're, you're, you're talking about wishing and hoping rather than formal commitments. Well, you probably would have said to us, Virginia, we weren't going to abolish the carbon tax with that Senate, the mining tax. Let's, let's, we let's, weren't let's, going to get through our with, future financial advice Let's stay with what's realistic and what's changes. actually happening right now, Josh Frydenberg. Let, let's leave that. You're talking, about, you're talking about, in this document, things that will be achieved in Australia in order to be part of lifting, uh, lifting global, the global economy and boosting the economy. You can't actually say it in relation to those measures now, can you? No, no, we can, Virginia. We're actually in a uh, running negotiation with the independent senators about a whole range of measures, and we're very confident we can introduce them. Plus, Australia has uh, you know, got a plan for boosting growth and boosting jobs, and we've already had more success than some people give us credit to. So just watch this space as far as that negotiation with the Senate goes. Um, in terms of the overall Brisbane Action Plan, the nearly 1,000 individual measures, well, they'll be monitored uh, by the OECD, by the IMF, to, to see if they can be implemented, because if they are, this is a $2 trillion dividend for the international economy, and most importantly of all, tens of millions of new jobs, because what we've seen around the world is while equity markets have gone up, stock markets have gone up, actually labour and unemployment is stubbornly high, and particularly in Europe, and particularly uh, here in, uh, in Australia, we want to bring that down. All right, good to talk to you this morning. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Virginia. Great to be with you.